Um, it gets its name because there's uh, many, many pond turtles here. They're probably hibernating right there and getting into hibernation mode. They'll start digging into a lot of these local banks and stuff. Usually if we start walking towards the back of the lagoon, um, you have to really watch where you're stepping because there's, there's, there'll just be pond turtles all, all around it. Um, that other site, the Paso Road de Laguna, so that was the other site that parking lot there and, and I pointed out um, there's lots of pond turtles over there too. So this site is it's a really awesome spot because we're all up the coast I'm sure what like when we, you were at the, the van right you had no idea that there was a lagoon out here right or even like a, a creek or a watershed right and so this stretch of coast is really cool because you get a lot of these cutouts, these natural cutouts in the watershed. You have all these really small watersheds that are going through, um, through the coast. You don't really see any roads, right? You don't see any trees. You don't see anything here. So this lagoon looks very similar to what it did back in the late 1800s or the 1900s. It's been, you know, the Of, of the sides have been manipulated a little bit of the lagoon because of cattle. I've seen, I, I came one time, and I'm shocked that there's not um, elephant seals here. Usually this is just packed with elephant seals and they're in the lagoon. They're, they're together. And one time I came in on the beach, there was a full bull with horns and everything just like napping on the beach. <laughs> so they have access to this coast. So they've obviously having cattle and a large mammal is going to manipulate a lot of the have any infrastructure that has confined or changed the, the dynamics, the hydrology of this lagoon, um, which is why this small of a lagoon, you can just look down here, it's it's deep. <laughs> so it can it can retain water for for periods of, of extended drought. So when we were going through like the 2013, 2014, 2015 droughts, and especially this stretch of the coast, like this the community, you go into the community and there was signs on like every single restaurant like like please ask us for water we're not going to give you water like they were in, in, in crunch time when it came to conserving water these lagoons they they kept water in them right so these are like foundational lagoons um habitats for a lot of, of most endangered species and so what's unique about this this is called so i can tell you right now even with a without a refractometer or anything um, to, to measure this value. This is called rupia, so this is widging grass. So emergent this, vegetation. Emergent vegetation, so that little patch right there that's floating, a little dark spot, is widging grass. There's a few stuff on the side, so it's different than these kind of little cattails that are coming out. Um, so this is, this is, you know, like a freshwater seagrass. So this is, this is a plant, and this will only be found in fresh water. So I know that the system is, salinity is extremely, extremely low. It's not even brackish. It might have gotten some wave overtopping, but this beach has a very large extended beach, right? So it's still, even with these king tides, you can still actually see, we just went through some king tides, right? And there's no real evidence of the king tides coming up that high on this beach. Um, so there probably wasn't any wave overtopping. There's no kelp, right? We've been going through like the, the big stretches of the cope when we see, you saw all of that that bull kelp and all of that macrocystis that was washed up on shore you don't see any evidence of this here right so now you have a coastal lagoon that's perched it's slightly perched so high high tide this lagoon is is higher than high high tide it's like sitting on top of it it keeps this fresh water body really close to the ocean because most of these lagoons that even get a little wave overwashing, they become a little brackish. You can't have amphibians in them, right? Amphibians, any type of, of, of newt, any type of frog and salt, they don't mix. Right? They need like almost like fresh, fresh seawater. And so in this site, you have California newts federally listed on the endangered species list as threatened. Um, you have red-legged frogs federally listed as endangered. You have western pond turtles federally listed as threatened. You have tidewater gobies federally listed as endangered. You have elephant seals that utilize this. This um, is not a Covered in 
covered these dunes. So like when you come in the spring, there's like this like magenta red color all over the dunes, which is really awesome. You can see it's like the top of that very top dune. That's it. Um, but so a lot of people don't realize it, but so this is a tidewater gobi in here. A really a small, a little small one. Oh, it's a micro dude. Probably about like 20 millimeters, so smaller than the ones that we had um, uh, on the other side. This is reproductive, so that one can, you know, have babies. They get reproductive around like 18, 20 millimeters. There's probably tens of thousands of them in this lagoon, so this lagoon is, is really important for this whole kind of coastal management. The way that these lagoons work and function, right, is a lot of them build these sandbars up, right? So in California, most of our season, uh, most of our lagoons or our coastal wetlands are considered seizing those lagoons um, or bar built estuaries. So, so there's a sandbar that develops for most of the year, right? Throughout summer, throughout fall, there'll be a sandbar. Um, sometimes they will look like they, they're bricks. So if you go to like San Simeon Creek, it looks like it's, it's bricks, it looks like it's connected to the ocean. The berm hasn't actually breached yet. You just had the, it's just the, the sandbar is slightly lower elevation. So with these high tides, they wash over. And so you'll, it looks like it's connected, but the bar has, the, the sandbar hasn't breached yet. It takes a lot for the system to breach. So probably like three, four, even five big rains, then it flushes out. So you'll get a big channel, it cuts out, and then it's like pulling the, the plugs in the bathtub. And so everything in here will get flushed out to shore. So that's bad. For many animals it is. If you're like in a, a not with, we have a lot of sites that have invasive species and things like that. It's a great way to flush them out because they can't, most invasive species are fresh water so they can't deal with, with the salt water foods and clears it out. Tidewater gobies, that's how they disperse from site to site. So they're considered a metapopulation. So, so the metapopulation for this site, for this recovery unit, is the Royal Dale Cruise. So that's the site that we were just at with Catherine, just north. When Catherine was saying, just go up like five minutes north, and there's like a really beautiful site. That's a Royal Dale Cruise. And then it goes all the way down to um, like, uh, like Via Creek. Um, which we passed on the way here. I'll point it out when we're driving. And so basically, if you have these big rocky headlands, tidewater goobies can't get around them. So if this kind of looks like a big rocky headland, it's not. There's enough sandy beach around the rocks for it to go. But um, in order for them to push this little bit, right? Like if this little fish gets flushed out to the ocean, it's just going to be food for a lot of animals, right? So they're, they're relying on sites next door to it to, to transition into and disperse into, right? That site also has to open at the same time. So like if this breaches, it's going to go out, but it relies on all these other sites to be open at the same time so it can flush it. It doesn't always work that way. So this, this, this fish is what we call, it's the most locally genetically um, differentiated species on, on the planet, or not on the planet, a vertebrate in California. It's it's kind of it's it's kind of up there because so when we say that it means that each population from population to population is so genetically distinct they're not really communicating with one another. This species is mo more genetically differentiated than that devil's hole pupfish that we were talking about that's in in the middle of Death Valley, right? That has all these like like isolated pools that never connect. So even one of these populations from, from, from a single subunit is more genetically distinct than those devil pulled pupfish. It's upwards of like a million years that they, they, they're differentiated. And those are subunits, very complicated, right? So you have all of these metapopulations. So those sites, Aro de la Cruz, down at Via Creek, they connect on some grounds, and it's usually during rainy seasons. But then you'll go to another recovery unit. And so that one will be like the one near like San Luis Obispo Creek, right? And so there's there's another recovery unit there. Usually all these recovery units are separated by big rocky headlands. So think of like Point Magoo, think about Palos Verdes, right? There's just rocks and no sand. And so 
the, what's really cool about this fish, I mean, it's not the sexiest looking fish in the world. It's not like, like super, it's not like those guppies you go to Petco and they're like flaring with all these different colors and stuff. You can't eat it. This fish can tell us so much about the entire California coast, it's ridiculous. And so most lagoons, we have 276 coastal bodies in California. Lagoons that vary in size. So you can have like the big Bodega Bays, you can have the big Moro Bays, the Carpinteria Marshes that we drove past. The majority of them, like 92% of them, are these. And so um, these these tell the story of California. It's a Mediterranean coastal California, Mediterranean environment. This is what California used to look like. Um, and there's one fish, one single fish that is has evolved to to adapt to these types of climates and that's this little unsexy brown looking fish um, and so there's so much story and history in these fish it's ridiculous a lot of it's in its genetics so we can actually tell when there is big rain events because we can actually tell when these sites have been communicating with each other we can tell when there's been big drought seasons because we can tell that there's a lack of dispersal and genetic you know uh, exchange for long periods of time we can tell when sites have gone extirpated for certain periods of time just based off of the genetics of this fish um, so it's really fascinating as someone who loves to go fishing and like catch big fish and I love going to aquariums and seeing really cool fish uh, that's awesome this fish is is is, is the, it's in the history and the story of it where it makes it so like it's why I'm still fascinated with it to, to this day um, it's also in a total extremophile. So right now, this doesn't look like a very harsh environment to live in. It's not, it's closed off. You don't get any predators coming in here. It's fresh water, all that stuff. This fish can deal with this, but then when this breaches and it's connected to the ocean, now you're going from fresh water to salt water. And if anyone's had any type of fish in an aquarium before, um, they usually does not mix, even when you mess up the water for just a little bit, right? And so I found these fish in systems and like ag agricultural channels and ditches that were twice that of the ocean, like 65, 68 parts per thousand. Only thing alive in it, it's it like there's, there's very, very few insects, very few um, aquatic uh, insects or, or aquatic invertebrates. Tidewater gobies are there. I've worked on Vandenberg Air Force Base. There's a, there's a little site just south of where SpaceX launches the Falcon 9. So the Falcon 9, which is a very sustainable rocket, right? It just, it's just like it's hydrogen, right? So it's, it's basically just you know, you know, like steam. You go out to the site, there's a little lagoon there, and it's actually pushed all the trees down so you can see where it's launched. And the steam has like nuked everything on it because it gets super hot. There's no insects, there's no there's no aquatic inverts. There's tidal water goes. Like like and so it tells you if this fish is critically endangered, it's certainly in like LA Ventura, San, San Diego counties. It's really because of what we're doing to those environments. It, these systems up here are not endangered. They're very, very, very healthy because we don't have any human really manipulation or impact. We might get the occasional, you know, like mosquito fish or something in these sites, or there might be some, you know, cow that comes in and, and takes a crap at the lagoon. But like, there's really not a lot of, of influence, which is why these these habitats are healthy. But once you go down south, right, you will see highways, you see homes, you see infrastructure which totally changed the dynamics of the systems. Um, 